Welcome to worship at Ebenezer, whether you're here in person or you happen to be watching this online, we are glad that you could worship with us. I'd like you to stand, please. And by the way, uh, happy Valentine's Day. I see some of these balloons. I wonder how many will go to the ceiling eventually. Uh, these little heart balloons, that's nice, nice little touch, very nice. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you most of all for your love as expressed in, in uh, Jesus, your son, the one who lovingly and willingly went to the cross to take upon himself my sin, my punishment, my condemnation. And because of your life, death, and resurrection, we can stand before you. And we thank you that we have this privilege of prayer and now can enter into your presence. Ask, Lord, that you will find our worship acceptable today. We ask, Lord, that your spirit be our teacher as we look at the word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship this morning. We're going to sing two songs today. Do It Again is the first one, a song of strength and the Lord's faithfulness to us. Uh, if you can think back um, through any time in your life, the Lord has been there and he will do it again. After that, we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All, a song of confession and a song of our recognition of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So will not you say hello to your neighbor? Say hello. Howdy, neighbor. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, let's raise up this song of victory. Do it again. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet i know the night won't last i know the night won't last your word will come to pass your word will come to pass my heart will sing my heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. Keep me within your love. My heart. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed. Your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you've never failed me. I've seen you move the mountains. 
I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again, you made a way, where there was no way, and I believe, I see you do it again, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again, you made a where there was no way and I believe I see you do it again you seen you move you move the mountains and I believe I see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and I believe I see you do it again I see you do it Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you've never failed me. You've never failed me yet. And I never will forget, you've never failed me yet, and I never will forget. Let's continue to sing, Jesus paid it all. Sometimes screens go out. Sometimes stuff happens. It's all right. Power through, right? It's no big deal. Thanks for getting that fixed, guys. Appreciate it. I hear the Savior say. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow for nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land 
Jesus paid it all, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I invite you to have a time of confession to the Lord. before and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips I still repeat Jesus paid it all all Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all to him, I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Washed it white as snow. Please be seated. Love is in the air. Can you sense it? Love is in the air. Well, we want to celebrate marriage today. So I'm going to ask you to do this. If you are married, and the only stipulation is your spouse must be with you. If you are married and your spouse is with you, I'm going to have you stand up, please. We're going to see who has been married the longest here. So if your spouse is here, you can stand up. And so let's see, first of all, if you have been married one year or less, honeymoon phase, sit down, one year or less. All right, was there one couple? Was it Bryce and Taylor? Bryce and Taylor, we have some candy for you. How many days have you been married? Well, at least he didn't say too long. (laughs) Well, congratulations, newlyweds. All right. That's right. All right, let's go. Uh, If you've been married uh, five years or less, go ahead and sit down. Five years and less. Let's see. We got a couple over here. Okay, how about uh, 10 years or less? A few more back there. Okay, how about 15 years or less? Oh, there's, there's a few. 20 years or less? (laughs) Oh. <laughs> 25 years or less? 30 years or less. Boy, we're getting up there now. 35 years or less? 40 years or less? 45 years or less? Oh, 50 years or less? 55 years or less? 60 years or less? Oh! (laughs) Mr. and Mrs. Bill. Yes, how many years? All right. We have some flowers and a box of chocolates for you. Let's give a round of applause. 
Also, I believe we had uh, second and third place back here. Dave, you got some candy for them, right? Who, who was, who was uh, silver and bronze back here? Gary, 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 weren't you one of the last ones? And, and Rich and Arlene, weren't you one of the last ones to sit down too? So Rich and Arlene, Gary and Dina, that's good. Yeah, there we go. All right. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, well, we're in a series uh, called um, The Need for Love, and the number one need that every human being on this planet Earth has is the need for love. Every person has this need for love. And God supplies for this need for love, uh, as we're talking about in February, four different ways. The first way is through family. Family is the basic building block to where you experience or should experience love first. And then we have uh, a spouse, we have friends, and we have God. All sources to experience love. And today we're going to talk about the love of a spouse, the love of spou the spouse. And we see this from the very beginning of creation. And I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. I want to briefly look at this passage in Genesis chapter 2 about God's design for, for marriage. And again, a source for our number one need, the source for love. And if you look at this account in Genesis chapter 2, and you actually look at the last verse of chapter 1, if you look at the last verse of chapter 1, God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So God looks at his creation and he says it's what? Very, very, it's very good. Well, then you go into more a specific account in Genesis chapter 2 of creation. And here is the, the pinnacle of, of God's creation is man and woman. And it talks about how God made Adam. He formed him out of the dust or the dirt of the ground. He shaped him, breathed into him the breath of life, and there was Adam. But then we have that, you know, Adam is tending the garden, the work that the Lord had given him, the garden of Eden, and we find out that there's a problem. Verse 18 of chapter 2. The Lord God said, it is not good. Oh, this is the first time that something not good has been mentioned. Remember the end of chapter 1, very good. But now all of a sudden we see here in verse 18 of chapter 2, this is not good. And we have to ask yourself, ourselves, what is not good? And we find out, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so the Lord takes Adam and he puts him under into a deep sleep. He removes one of Adam's ribs and he fashions out of that rib a woman, a woman. And God brings the woman Eve to Adam. And he's got to almost be kind of mind blown by what he sees. But then the Lord says in verse 24, he gives us this, this aspect, this great aspect of, of marriage between a man and a woman where he says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united or cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. Here we see this idea, God's design, God's design of marriage, bringing man and woman together in marriage. And there's three principles of marriage where they leave. This means that there's a declaration to the community around them and there is a ceremony takes place that shows that this man and this woman are being united together. I love the word in, the, in King James Version that uses the word cleave. And cleave is the idea of God gluing two people together. He's bonding them together with super glue that they become what? United, gluing together, bonding, becoming one. Becoming one. So it's like God takes the man and the woman and he puts them together and makes them, glues them together and makes them one. This is God's design, 
God's design of marriage. And then in the scripture, there's, there's verses, there's scriptures that talk about the love between a man and a woman. And I want to share here two verses in scripture describing the love between a husband and a wife. The first one is the man speaking. This is Solomon in of, uh, Proverbs 5, verse 18. Uh, Solomon, to give you a little context, because what context is important, right? Actually, uh, Solomon is sitting down with his sons, and he's giving them, them a, a sex education lesson. And he's telling them, you can uh, go after women all you want, but that's a bad course of action for you as a, f- a follower of God. Instead, you are to be married. And he says this in verse 18, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Here he's telling these young men, you are to get married. And as you grow in your marriage with this woman, you're both going to eventually age. But he says, rejoice in the wife of your youth. For one thing, she's still with you. So rejoice, rejoice. She's still the girl that you married. There is satisfaction in her that you won't find with another woman. That's the context of Proverbs chapter 5. Well, later on, the woman gives voice to married love. And one of the illustrations is this in the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 7. And here the wife says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it out. And I like what even the second part, which I didn't put up on the screen, but the second part of that verse says this, If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. So even before the Beatles saying, saying, can't buy me love, it was in the scripture right here. Money can't buy a love. And the kind of love that is talked here by this married woman is a love that cannot even be quenched by a tidal wave, by a flood. Waters can't destroy it. And what we need to ask ourselves, this word love, because it says many waters cannot quench love. What kind of love is it talking about? Because we have a hard time in our English language knowing exactly when we use the word love, how are we defining it? Well, the neat neat thing is the Hebrew language defines the word love. And here the word for love in this particular verse, Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 7, is the word ahava, ahava. And this, basically, a definition of this love and, and really, if you remember this phrase, you'll do well. This, this definition of love, ahava, is a giving love. Now, remember we've talked about how, what is our number one need as human beings? It's the what? Need for what? Love. But also, as we mature, we also not only need to be needing love, we also want to be able to what? Give love. And here, ahava is this idea of giving love completely devoted to another person. And another aspect about ahava love is always remember this, that it requires action. Giving is an action. It's not just lip service, it is action. Not even based upon feelings. Of course, the person who really shows The ultimate in Ahava love is who? God himself. Even that verse that we know in the New Testament, John 3, 16, says what? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. His love is a giving love. And actually, the better that we connect with the Lord through Jesus Christ, the better that we will be able to give love to others, and especially to our spouse. This is the reason why C.S. Lewis said this, God loves us, not because we are lovable, you might think you are, but not because we are lovable, but because he is love. Not because he needs to receive, but he delights to give. Ahava, 
giving love. This wife of Solomon says, this love is so deep, waters cannot quench this love. Well, what is interesting in the New Testament, as Jesus one time encounters some Pharisees in Matthew chapter 9, where the Pharisees ask Jesus, is it, okay, is it permissible, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus does not answer the question directly, but he answers it with Scripture. He actually goes and refers back to Genesis 2.24, and he gives that statement that God gave about the design of marriage between a man and a woman, where he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, will be united or will cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And he basically says there's a question mark here because he's saying to the Pharisees, if anybody should know this, you guys should. You, you should know this. You guys are experts in knowing the scriptures. You should know this. And then he goes on and he says this, where he says, Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let no one separate. And so I thought about that phrase, let no one separate. So here we have a man and a woman. They're bonded together. Is that if we're not careful, there's forces in our marriages that will come and try to fray the edges of our bonding. And we can ask ourselves, what are some of those forces that want to be separators? What's going to try to separate? What's going to try to fray the edges of our bond? And, and so here's some ideas. Some ideas. The first one is opposites attract, then they irritate the snot out of us. Well, I didn't put the irritate the snot out of us, but it's absolutely true. When my wife Pat and I uh, first got married, we went to a marriage seminar, and a part of this marriage seminar uh, was, uh, was taking a personality test to see what you were like as a person, how you're kind of wired personality-wise. And it used the idea of animals. And so we ended up taking the test, and I ended up being a lion. And a lion is king of the jungle. You better believe it. I'm talking to you now. You better be paying attention. This is what a lion does. A lion is a leader. A lion's a leader. Le leader makes decisions. He follows through on those decisions. And get in line. What are you slacking for? Well, this might be a reason why I was a captain of the college football team, why I was a leader of youth ministry, and why I'm a senior pastor. Kind of makes sense. I'm kind of wired this way to be a leader. Well, Pat, on the other hand, she was the animal type called a beaver. And as a beaver, they like things precise. They like things orderly. They like th things clean. All right. So when I first met Pat and Pat met me, it's like, we're opposites. She, Pat appreciated this aspect that I could make a, make a decision. And she was willingly, what, going to follow and I liked it that Pat picked up after herself. It was, it was all good. It was all good. But then you get into marriage, and after a while, these, these, these you know, and the, I think that there's some truth to that statement that opposites attract and then opposites marry. I think there is some, some validity to that. You're trying, you find somebody who's a bit different than you are. Well, after a while, I'm making all the decisions, and Pat's saying, uh, do I ever get to have a say in what's happening? And so, like, even this week, I said, what would you like to do for Valentine's Day? I just, I just want to give you a couple options. <laughs> I'm still giving her a choice, right? I'm giving her a couple options. <laughs> I'm trying to learn this, you know? I'm trying, you know? And, and, and likewise, because she's, she's this beaver personality, I got to always pick up after myself. If I don't, I, I, get, in, I get in trouble. All, all I'm saying is, you see, sometimes these what was attractive, especially at first, and when you're still in that little honeymoon stage back there, you cute little couple, <laughs> you know, but eventually it comes a little bit of an irritate, so we have, so it's, but, but it is good to know how you're wired to begin with. Another thing is possible, something to fray the edge, are, are, are kids, and do kids take a lot of time? Yes, they do. They take a lot of energy? Yes, they do. And Sometimes we got to be careful as a, as a married couple that our, our love for our kids, which we need to love our kids, 
doesn't replace our love for our spouse. Because eventually you want to train your kids so that they're out of the house. And then who's going to still be there? Your spouse. So we have to be kid that, careful that our kids don't become a separator. We also got to be careful of screenshots. And by that, I mean like social media. Sometimes we can look at social media. And again, usually on, on social media, oftentimes we're either the, the hero or the victim. But we see on that like, wow, look at that. Look at that couple, what they're doing. Wow, I wish we would do something like that. So we get maybe a little jealous, a little, maybe a little resentful. Or we, or we see, like, maybe, maybe we just spend a lot of time on social media, time that I could give to my spouse. Am I missing something with my spouse because I'm so engaged with social media? And then couples can get into ruts, routines, complacency. Everything's the same. Things become dull. And then when they become dull, sometimes we always think that, well, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Or as the comedian Irma Bombeck years ago said, the grass is always greener on the septic tank. So to always be a reminder that there's a reason why the grass looks greener. And oftentimes our imaginations at this point when they start fraying the edge of our marriage relationship is because we, our imaginations think, think it will be better. But don't let your imagination go there. You can't allow that to happen. If anything, if you start getting attracted to someone else, th imagine what the worst consequences would be. And the consequences are bad and terrible. Now, you might be able to put some other items in there, and that's, that's great. I want you to. But as we find, oftentimes, love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. And so how do we experience this ahava love, this giving love that we need to experience? And... Let me, let me give you some ideas, and they all, these words or phrases all start with the letter S. The first one is that we seek Jesus together. As a couple, you want to seek Jesus together. And even on a daily ex uh, expression, if nothing else, pray with your spouse over, over lunch or supper or whatever. You're, you're a, a praying person. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, Pat and I went to Cupid over in Lima, and if you know anything about Cupid, you can't go inside uh, and eat. But you can, take, you can order inside and then take it to the car. And so I ordered inside. I took the hamburgers and all that to the car, and we parked out front and ate our, our meal there because it's kind of hard to drive with a hamburger and frosty, yeah, you, you know, driving. It's, it can't happen. But anyway, so we were parked there. Another couple comes and parks beside us, and they're a little bit older than Pat and I because we're so young. But anyways... Um, we saw them, they bowed their heads, and they prayed. It was awesome. And it wasn't, I could tell it wasn't a prayer like, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. It wasn't that kind of a prayer. Because, like, I took a couple bites of my hamburger, I looked over, they're still praying. Wow. I thought, that is cool. They were seeking Jesus together through, through a prayer before they ate their food. And then I think another way is just as simply as, as with your spouse, you worship together. You make it a priority to, to worship together. You come together at church and worship on a regular basis. Also experiencing ahava love, ahava love is, is to speak, how we use our, our words. First of all, we want to be able to communicate. And I find this true. I found it even true this week because uh, some people say that I don't hear as well as I used to. Pastor David Glick. Anyways, um, maybe it's my age. I don't know. But anyways, uh, there are times where this, even this week, we, I experienced this where Pat was off in another room and I was in another room and Pat's talking to me, and it's like, Pat, I don't know why you're saying. I'm a leader. Get in the room. No, I don't know. <laughs> no, but communication. You've got to. GTE, you got to go, G, go to the same room, same area. T, you got to turn your head towards the person, and E, have eye contact. And guess what? When you do that, you're better off having good conversation. You're communicating well. So that has been a little lesson for, for me. It helps me. And then when we do speak, we need to know, again, and we did a message on this just a short while ago, the power of words, right? Words have power, either to give life or to take life away. 
So we need to be very careful of the words that we use with our spouse. Because once we speak the words, we cannot take them back. All right. Another aspect of ways that we can experience ahava love, this giving love with our spouse, is to remember the spark. Keep dating. Even when you have kids, get somebody to babysit. Keep dating. Show your spouse that he or she is special. Continue to take care of yourself on a, on a physical basis. Take as best physical care of yourself that you can. It's important to have boundaries. And by that, I mean boundaries with people of the opposite sex. Try not to be alone with someone of the opposite sex. Share passwords on all your devices with your spouse so they can check your phone or your computer at any time that they want to. Once again, just having boundaries in your relationship. And then have those moments for intimacy, even if you have to put them on your calendar, do so. Have moments of intimacy. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about the idea of a, a married couple can say, hey, you know what, we're going to commit to a time of prayer. But then the Apostle Paul tells that couple, he says, but make sure that you eventually come together sexually. Experience that sexual relationship together as a married man and woman. The great German reformer said that uh, he wrote this about this particular passage in 1 Corinthians 7. He said his, his insight was, I, you know, I think as long as you have that sexual relationship twice a week, that will keep the devil away. I don't know what his wife Kate thought, but anyways, that's what Martin Luther wrote, all right? So, moments for intimacy, so important. Then I think looking for ways to serve. Serve together. Serve in your church. There's something about being together and serving, being involved in ministry. Is there something, you can always ask this question, is there something that we can do as a couple in the church? And the same thing goes to your community at large because we're to make an influence, the community, and we can do that together as a couple. Is there a way that we can serve the community together? So these aspects can really help us, I, I believe, when it comes to experiencing ahava love. Now, I want to talk about another love, a love that is even more important than the love that a man and a woman have for each other in marriage. And that's the love, and we sang about it today, that love that Christ has for us. And in reality, Jesus is to be our first love. Because first of all, you have to, there, are, there are some people who are here and who are watching this who are single, for instance. They may be single because death took their spouse. could be divorce. It could be that God has just given them the gift of being single. Whatever it might be. We need to realize that there is a greater love than the, even the love of a man has for a woman in marriage. And that's God's love. God's love. We need to, he needs to be our first love. And actually, Scripture is full of this aspect that God's people are like the bride. And Christ, or God, is the groom. In the Old Testament, just check out the, the prophet Hosea. He uses that image of marriage and how Israel was unfaithful to her husband, God. And likewise, here the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said about Jesus being their first love, he said, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. And I like, I like this idea that this is a quote that is attributed to C.S. Lewis, who said this, A woman's heart should be so close to God that a man should have to chase him to find her. I also think it works for the other way, too, for the man to be so close to God that she has to chase God to get to him. And that's really living out that whole Matthew 6.33 where Jesus said that we're to what? Seek first our marriages. It's not what he said. He said, seek first his kingdom. We need to be seeking first his kingdom. Be faithful to Christ. Love him first and foremost. Realizing even if we are married, that marriage is only temporary. I hate to break it to you. 
It's only temporary. Once we enter eternity, Jesus will be our groom, and we are his bride. So here we are. What's today? It's Valentine's Day. And I pray that the Lord will strengthen our marriages, that we will find ways to demonstrate our committed love to our spouses today. The Ahava love that the Song of Songs 8-7 talks about. And as we apply this love, I like this, the story of this young boy went to this Jewish rabbi and asked the rabbi, why do we have two eyes? Why do we have two eyes? And the rabbi said, well, that's because the left eye, you should look at yourself and see where you need to improve. Then with your right eye, you look at others with love, always seeking out their best. That, I think, is great for us as married couples. Realizing that Ahava love is a love that money can't buy. And it's a love like a tidal wave. That even a tidal wave can't wash this away. Might we give love, the Ahava love. Realizing that that love is a love of action. It's of giving not based upon our feelings. And what will oftentimes feel like, or what will oftentimes happen to us, feelings will follow our actions. So look for ways to love your spouse today. After all, it's Valentine's Day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful gift the way you have designed marriage for a man and a woman. And I, and I pray, God, that, um, wow, we have some very faithful examples here of couples who have been married for years. You have proven yourself faithful. I pray, God, for those who might be struggling a bit, that, Lord, that you would prompt them to see their responsibility and how they can give love to their spouse. And then, Lord, for all of us, no matter our age, to realize that you are the great lover and that you have expressed your giving love in the person of Jesus Christ. And because of that relationship through Christ that we can have with you, it's a relationship that will last forever. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jim, for sharing um, your heart and the opening the word of God this morning. You know, I couldn't help but notice uh, when we were doing the exercise earlier that my wife and I were standing there together, and I looked around, and we were really surrounded by a bunch of old people. It was, uh, it was really strange. I mean, other than us, it was very, very strange. No, that was, that's great. And uh, let's stand and sing, uh, Jesus Loves Me. It's not that Jesus loves me, but we can sing that one later if we want. But A great song of, uh, of the Lord's love for us, a reminder. And we can't run from his presence. Here we go. I was lost. I was in chains. The world had a hold of me. My heart was a stone. I was covered in shame. When he came for me. I couldn't run. Couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loves me. He loves me. He is for me. Jesus, how can it be? He loves me. He is for me. There was a fire deep in my soul. I'll never be the same. I stepped out of the dark and into the light. 
when he called my name. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is born. for me. He holds the stars and he holds my heart with healing hands that bear the scars. The rugged cross where he died for me. My only hope, my everything. Jesus he loves me, he loves me, he is for me, Jesus, how can it be, he loves me, he is for me, Jesus, he loves me, he loves me, he is for How can it be? He loves me. He is for me. I'd like to give a report from the pastoral search committee. The Senior Pastor Search Committee has held preliminary interviews with five candidates for the position of Senior Pastor. From these five candidates, the Search Committee has selected Pastor Brad Moore of Indiana. On, September, on, on Saturday, March 13th, Pastor Moore will meet with the pastoral team, leadership, and various ministries of the church to continue the interview process. The next step would be for Pastor Moore to return on Sunday, April the 11th, to be introduced to the congregation prior to our congregational vote at a later time. Please continue to be in prayer for God's direction as we seek his will for our next senior pastor of Ebenezer Mennonite Church. Shall we close in prayer? Father, we thank you for the great example that we've heard today from Pastor's teaching that God came into the world to give us a gift of love. As we reflect on that great gift, what it means to us personally, what it means to us collectively, as we go from here to be in the community, to be the light, the salt, forever God puts us. Help us to be faithful with that love, first in our families, and then to our communities, and to wherever you lead us. Help us to reflect on that great love you've given to us. In Christ's name.